Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth video of the Gloom tutorial series where we are building a entire first person shooter game in TypeScript. So in this video I had originally planned to tackle keyboard input uh, and probably the game and the input handler but I realized that a dependency of those things would be the need to create our messaging system and a data manager. Uh, not so much the data manager but I think I want to go ahead and get that out of the way just because it's a utility that we're going to need a lot uh, later down the road and I'd like to sort of get some of this scaffolding stuff out of the way early on. The first thing we're going to tackle is a messaging system. Under source we'll create a new file call it message ts and under source we're going to want to create another new file called iMessage handler ts and once more under source we're going to want to create one more new file called iMessage.ts. So under iMessage we'll export a new interface called iMessage. This will have three properties, code, sender, and context. That's all we need from iMessage so we can actually close this file. Under iMessage Handler, we want to export a new interface called iMessage Handler. To that we want to add one method called onMessage. And this takes an argument of an iMessage with return type void. And of course we need to import iMessage. We're also done with this file so we can close it. In MessageTS, we'll export a class called Message. This is where the meat and potatoes of the messaging system are actually going to live. First and foremost, we'll need to create a static subscriptions, which is a dictionary, and its key is of type string. Its value is an array of iMessage handlers. And obviously we'll need to import iMessage handler. We'll also want to make sure that message implements iMessage. Of course, we'll need to import iMessage. Next, we'll need to add our public properties, code, sender, and context. We'll want to add a public constructor which takes in code, sender, and an optional context, and then sets those things appropriately. And the next thing we'll want to set up is a public static method called subscribe. So the way that this message system is going to work is we have a message code, which is a string, that anything that implements iMessage handler can subscribe and listen for. Anytime a message is sent with that code, on message is called against that class which implements iMessage handler. And so this provides us a very easy, lightweight way to decouple our code and be able to send messages back and forth between different parts of the system without them having to know about one another. So our subscription is the first step of that process. The code for this is very simple. First, we want to use our new utilities exists method, which means we'll need to import utilities. And we check to see if a subscription with that code already exists. If it does not exist, we go ahead and we create an empty array to put our handlers in. We then push the supplied handler to that array. Pretty simple stuff. Next, we need an unsubscribe method so that we can stop listening for messages. Here we'll pass the code to stop listening to and the handler to be removed. First, we check to see if anything is subscribed to that node whatsoever. For now, we're going to warn that nothing is subscribed to it, but eventually we'll want to remove this. This is here purely for debugging purposes. In fact, I'll add a to-do just to remove the debug a code later on. So if that does exist, then we retrieve the index of the handler from that array. If it exists, then we go ahead and we splice the entry from the array. If that array is now empty, we go ahead and undefine it so that we're not holding memory for that anymore. All right, so the last piece of this puzzle is a send method, which is static as well. It takes in the code that we'll be sending it takes in the sender, which can be anything, so we can send messages from anywhere in the system, and it takes our optional context. This simply checks to see if uh, anything is subscribed. If not, it immediately boots out. Uh, if something is subscribed to it, then we create a new message object with the code sender and context. And then for each handler in that subscription node, we go ahead and we call on message. So this is where the magic actually happens, so to speak. And that's it guys. Uh, as far as the message system goes, it's as easy to set up as that. Nice and lightweight. So in our plan, we can move our messaging system to done. Okay, the next thing to tackle is going to be the data manager. This is going to be another super lightweight class. So under core, we'll create a new file, call it data manager.ts. As you may have guessed, we're going to export a class called data manager. Similar to the messaging system, we're going to create an internal dictionary, only this time it still takes a string for the key, but it takes any for the value type. 
Next, we'll want to mark the constructor private to enforce a singleton pattern. And I realize that singletons are not something that should be used all over the place, but they do have their place, and this is one of them. So uh, we want to keep everything uh, static. We don't need to create an instance of this. So to prevent that in code, we mark the constructor private. Next, we're going to add a public static get value. And this is the, uh, if you're from C++, this is the template or the generic typing that we allow. And basically, uh, what this allows us to do is specify the type of the object that we're going to be retrieving and automatically cast it when we return it. All this does is returns the dictionary value of the entry with the key uh, with the past name. Uh, and then that's returned, uh, casted to T, which is the type that's provided here. So this is just a, a nice clean way to be able to do that. And then finally, we need a set value, which essentially does the other half of the equation, uh, where it takes a name and a value of type T, and then uh, stores it in the data manager accordingly. And that is all that there is to the data manager. Again, simple, lightweight, but it's a way for us to store information in a global sort of context without having to use global variables everywhere. So I'm gonna close out some files here. And on our readme, we're gonna take our data manager and move it to done. Great, so the next thing that we need to tackle is our keyboard input. Uh, and this actually goes kind of hand in hand with the input handler. So I'm actually gonna move this to this step because they're kind of the same thing. Um, and this game is just a game class. I'm just gonna update that real quick. So it's a little bit more clear as to what we're doing. Okay, so input handler. So under core, we're gonna create a new file. We'll call it input manager.ts. As you probably guessed, we're going to export a class called input manager. And this is going to be a, another example of a static class. So the first thing we wanna do is mark the constructor private. One of the first things we're gonna need is a tracking system to tell whether keys are up or down. And we can simply do this with a Boolean. And the way that this is going to work is we're going to store a Boolean value for each of the key codes uh, for every key. So uh, we're going to create a, uh, an array of 256 keys. The key code will be the index of the array for that particular key. And then true or false uh, will be whether the key is up or down. True will be down, false will be up. So the first method we'll want to create is an initialize method. And that actually takes in a HTML canvas element viewport, which you're gonna need later, but we still want to save that off. So I'm going to say, uh, we'll create a new viewport here uh, that's of type HTML canvas element. And the first thing in here, we'll say input manager dot viewport equals viewport. Next, we'll create that uh, array of 256 keys and we'll set them all to false. Next, we'll create some event listeners and attach those to the key down and key up events of the window. Tie those to input manager on key down and on key up respectively. So as you may have guessed, uh, those two methods will be private, uh, but they'll also be static. So for on key down, we're gonna take in the keyboard event and then extract the key code from that and use that to set the appropriate array entry to true. And we'll do the same except setting it to false for key up. Pretty straightforward and simple. The next thing that we're gonna actually wanna do is set up a message to be sent out whenever one of these events happens. So under core, I'm gonna create one more new file and I'm gonna call this input event message. I'm simply going to export an enumeration called input event message. And there's gonna be one for key down, one for key up and they're gonna be a string value for the enumerator. So what this does is it gives us a nice, safe way to register for these messages, as well as send the messages so that we don't have a typo like adding an extra underscore or um, get the casing wrong or something along those lines. And so in the input manager on key down, we're going to send a message and we're gonna use this input event message key down as the code. And that translates to a string in JavaScript. And then uh, as far as the sender, we're actually gonna, we're going to pass undefined here because we don't have an instance of the input manager to send along and that's fine. Uh, and then as a context, we're gonna actually pass the keyboard event information along in case we need that on the other side somewhere. So obviously this means that we'll have to import message and we'll need to import input event message. And then under on key up, we'll do the same thing except we'll pass 
input event message key up. One more thing that we'll want to do is we'll want to add a couple of public uh, static accessor methods for uh, checking if a current key is up or down. So there'll be one called is key down and one called is key up, and they both return a Boolean. So is key down returns if the entry with that key code is true, and then is key up basically does the opposite, uh, returning if it's equal to false. So this is a nice easy way to check from anywhere in the system if a key is currently held down or if it's currently up. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the input manager for now. We'll be adding mouse input information uh, a little bit later in the series, but for now, uh, this will do. So in the readme, I'm going to go ahead and take input handler and keyboard input and move that to done. One more thing that we need to do uh, to cross that off in engine start, before we set up the viewport or any of that stuff, we need to call our input manager dot initialize and pass it this dot viewport. Okay, so input is now properly hooked up. So the next thing on our list to tackle is setting up a game class. Uh, and a game class is actually what's going to hold some of our game specific logic, such as what level we currently have loaded, our player object eventually, things of that nature. So let's go ahead and create that. So under source, create a new file, call it game.ts. We'll export a class called game, okay? And then we're gonna actually move some things out from engine that were temporary. So our camera and our scene are now gonna move to the game. Okay, and we'll just add those imports. All right, and obviously that presents some issues uh, with our some of our function calls in here. So we'll address those in a moment. In game, we want to first add a public uh, constructor. We won't be adding anything here yet, but uh, we will need that eventually. Next, I'm going to add a public accessor for the active camera, which for now will just return the camera itself. I'm not gonna add one for the scene um, because I'm gonna wait until we actually implement the levels to do that. So next, I'm going to create a public method called onStartup that takes the aspect ratio. And the reason for this is that the camera creation is actually happens here. So I'm going to take actually everything in this to-do section and cut it from engine and paste it into this method. And instead of using aspect, uh, this dot aspect rather, I'm gonna change that to aspect, add the missing imports. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is change our game class definition to implement iMessage handler, which means that we need to add a on message and of course add the import. And in here, we're going to switch on message dot code as far as how this is handled. And we're going to paste in two cases. Uh, so first we'll add our import. So if we receive a key up message, we're gonna to wanna to call this dot on key up and then pass along the keyboard event from the context and the same for key down. Obviously we don't have these methods yet, so let's go ahead and create those. So now we have our on key down and on key up. So whenever we, we receive a message uh, for that, um, these methods will be called which also means that uh, we're not gonna receive the message unless we subscribe to it. So in on startup, we'll need to add a couple of message subscriptions, one for key down, one for key up, and pass this as the message handler, and that will make sure that those things get called. Great, so uh, the next thing that we're going to want to do is add a couple of new methods. We're going to add one called start new, which is when we start a new game. Uh, and we'll eventually add one called load game, but for now, uh, we're, we're always gonna be starting a new game until we actually get a loading system in place, uh, which is going to be quite a ways down the road. However, in the meantime, uh, we can stub it out, so we'll say load existing, and we'll just throw an exception if this is called for now. So I'm actually going to take this scene logic and move it to start new for now. So the difference here is on startup is when the engine is finished with all of its preloading that needs to happen and it's ready to run. This method will be called for any sort of uh, game level initialization that needs to happen. And then when we actually start a new game, start new will be called. And when we load an existing game, load existing will be called. So the last thing we'll wanna add is a public update method that will be called uh, from the engine itself so that this 
game can be updated. The other thing that I noticed is that the uh, this said three dot camera that should just be camera, so we need to add the import for that. Uh, and we do actually need temporarily this active scene, so we'll go ahead and add that in there. And of course, we're missing our uh, implements, our import for our implements iMessage handler, so we'll add that. And I believe that actually should be it for now. So eventually, we're not going to need this call anymore, and we may not even need this. But uh, until we actually get everything flushed out, that's how we're going to have to do it. Okay, so back in the engine the top, we're going to create a new game, which means we need to add the import. And actually, this physics world stuff should move out of here too, so I'm actually going to go ahead and move that now as well to game. Which means the creation of it is also moved to game. And we'll move the box 2D import. And all of these three calls can be removed from engine. So now that all that stuff is out of there, in our constructor, we'll create our game instance in start. Right before the loop kicks off, we'll say this.game.startup, and we'll pass this aspect. In our update, before we update our renderer, we'll call this.game dot update and then in the renderer we will change this dot scene to this dot game dot active scene and this dot camera to this dot game dot active camera let's go ahead and build and run for some reason our geometry is no longer appearing so it looks like we actually got a bunch of errors in our console so let's see what happened there forgot to call start new so Right after on startup, we're going to temporarily call uh, this game start new. Uh, eventually, this needs to be menu driven, obviously, uh, and there are a couple of other things we're going to have to change revolving around this. But for now, we'll go ahead and call that there. Build again, run, and now we're back in business. So uh, we've added a whole bunch of things, but uh, we don't actually have anything visually changing on the screen. So we can actually change that with a couple of quick updates. So in the update of the game, we we'll want to say if input manager is key down, and we'll want to use key code 65, uh, and that's the A key. So let's go ahead and just put a comment here. So if the A key is held down, we want to move the camera forward. And so in this case, that actually means reducing the Z axis for now. So we can say this camera position dot Z minus equals, we'll say five times dt. Five would be the movement rate at this point, and dt would be the delta time. And we want to multiply that by delta time so that we maintain a smooth movement rate regardless of frame rate. So let's go ahead and build that and test it real quick. And so when I press A, you can see that it moves forward. Now that I think about it, it actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense to tie, to tie that to a, so let's tie that to 87 instead, which is W. Now, obviously, we're not going to want to just modify the Z position. What we're gonna to wanna to do instead is we're going to want to figure out what the forward direction of the camera is and move in that space instead, but I don't necessarily wanna cover that in this video. This video has gone on uh, long enough. Uh, one thing that I will do really quickly is add in S to be able to move backwards which is 83, add to the Z axis there, run, and now we can move backwards and forwards at a decent rate. In our readme, our game class is implemented. Uh, it's far from complete. There are many things that we'll be adding, but we have it in place and running. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that as done for right now. So next time we're actually going to set up a level system where we'll be adding a little bit more interesting stuff to our level in general. Um, we'll add some different geometry to it and start building things out so that it starts to look like our, our sort of boxy level that we want. And that may actually spawn over a couple of videos. So uh, I know up till now we've been sort of covering a lot of things really quickly, but the level system and the geometry generation may take a little bit longer. And we're also going to tackle uh, some things like um, a little bit better camera movement so that we can debug properly. 
And then after that, uh, we will obviously be creating physics and the pawn, which uh, pawns are the characters that move around the scene. So we'll be creating those, and then once we create that, we'll really be able to navigate our scene properly. Uh, and then it's not too much longer until we actually get to the level editor. So uh, we're at the point now where we've got a game, uh, sort of, that runs. Uh, it's updatable, it takes input, things like that nature. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this video here. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time.